out tonight. I'm Terry Campbell. I'm the adult program coordinator here at the library. Before we start another Nature Speaks, I want to mention that the next one is going to be in June, so save the date. For th Thursday, June 28th, we'll have Dr. Gerald Wilhelm. So I'll look for that in our June newsletter. Um, we also have some announcements from the Prospect Heights Natural Resource Commission where we partner with these programs. So Dana, do you want to tell them about the wonderful Earth Day events we have? Yeah. Certainly. Uh, Coming up. This is uh, Earth Week for us. This is uh, our kickoff event here with uh, Allison. And um, on uh, Saturday, we have our first bird walk, the uh, Bird Conservation Network. People are leading uh, the bird walk. It starts at um, the picnic area at uh, the Marava Center. We'll take a bus over to over to the Isaac Walton platform. And then we're going to go on a, a complete bird walk around the slough and then bus back over to uh, Isaac Walton. And then um, <clears throat> uh, on Sunday is our uh, w a special edition work day. Um, and we're going to start at the slough with a, uh, a one hour walk, an interactive walk. Agnes will be leading a tour and, and discussing what we're doing over there. Uh, when we come back to uh, 9 East Marion, the where it's going to meet, uh, you'll have your choice of either working with the greenhouse program to transplant plants, or you can go out with us and plant uh, native shrubs and oak saplings. So, um, a full uh, roster of events. Thank you. And it's all free? Yes, everything is free. And if you have any questions, you can ask us after uh, the uh, talk tonight, or you can go to our website phnrc.com and on the calendar of events, all that information is there. Thank you. Oh, all right, so tonight's program is in partnership with the Prospect Heights Natural Resource Commission. And tonight we have the Curator of Herpetology from the Chicago Academy of Sciences and the Peggy Notebert Nature Museum, Dr. Allison Sacerdote Ballette. So please welcome Allison. <laughs> Well, good job with my last name. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for coming out and hearing about uh, smooth green snake conservation efforts that we're working on here in northern Illinois. I'm going to be talking about a couple of different facets of the work that we're doing, as well as some of the natural history of the species and uh, some of the threats that they're facing, and then uh, some of the ways that we're approaching uh, conservation methods. I think I have to switch this on. Okay, there we go. So uh, smooth green snakes are, uh, Latin name is Ophiodres vernalis. They're active uh, typically most years late April, this year, don't hold me to that, um, all the way until late October. And they're very small bodied snakes. So you can see in this photo here, this is about a week old smooth green snake weighs about as much as a cotton ball. And here we've got a fully grown reproductive female, not that much bigger. She's certainly larger, but also a very uh, small and cryptic snake to be looking for in the grasslands. And this species primarily feeds on insects. They eat grasshoppers, they eat um, crickets, smooth-bodied caterpillars, small day-flying moths. And so they're serving the function of uh, some population control on plant defoliators. So they're uh, helping the prairie plants uh, so that they're not totally overrun by grazing insects. And uh, obviously they're gonna be grassland dependent. They have this bright green coloration that's going to help them blend in with a variety of grass dominated open canopy systems. And so that's gonna make it very tricky to survey for them. And one of the interesting things about them compared to some of the other small bodied snakes in our area is that they're egg layers, they're oviparous. Now most people um, associate reptiles with being oviparous, but uh, for most of the snakes in our area, the garter snakes, the brown snakes, the red-bellied snakes, and historically the Massasauga rattlesnake, these are all live-bearing snakes. The only ones that lay eggs besides the green snake in our area are the milk snake and the fox snake. Those are much larger snakes capable of dispersing further and producing larger clutches of eggs. So this is uh, a couple of examples of what their habitat looks like. They use a variety of tall grass prairie ecosystems, oak savanna, savanna edges, 
wet meadows, usually sedge meadows, and when they overwinter, they kind of communally den, and they'll go into burrows within these inactive ant mounds that you might stumble over in the prairie like I do when I'm out looking for snakes and <laughs> tend to trip over them when the vegetation gets high. Uh, they have networks of tunnels that they take advantage of that the ants have made, but once the ants vacate these, these um, large kind of mounds in the prairie, those networks go several meters below the ground and they serve as communal hibernacula, not just for green snakes, but for garter snakes and brown snakes and red bellies. And there's some vertical stratification. So green snakes tend to start overwintering first. They're down the deepest. Then we get the brown snakes and the red bellies. Then we get the garter snakes at the top. So that's one of the reasons you see the garter snakes kind of coming out earliest. So several people have, have seen garter snakes already this year out basking on the sunny days. They're gonna be the most susceptible to changes in soil temperature because they're the closest to the surface. Green snake's gonna be the last one to come up. They also will use these kind of large diameter rotting logs. So if you're in the area of the vicinity of an oak savanna where there's some downed large trees, they take advantage of those rotting logs. They can den and nest in those as well. So why do we care about smooth green snakes? Well, aside from being the cutest snake in the world, um, <laughs> they are an Illinois species in greatest conservation need. So they're not afforded right now the same protections as a threatened or endangered species because we don't have very detailed population data showing exact trends in their populations that are just hard to sample for. Um, it's hard to get a lot of recapture data, so it's very challenging to get definitive population estimates for this species. We know there are less populations than there used to be, so it's on our radar. We're under, under the um, assumption that we're seeing less of them because there's less habitat available, but even in places that have been protected, people are seeing less green snakes than they used to when they just walk through prairie even where there was remnant. Um, in Indiana, Iowa, and Ohio, they are considered state endangered. And in uh, most of their other range states, I know it's a little bit hard to see here, but highlighted in green, this is their range. They're considered either in greatest conservation need or critically imperiled. Now they have this kind of north, northern, northeastern distribution. Um, so the, Mid or the Atlantic states, uh, the maritime provinces of Canada support them. And then they kind of occur in the mi northern Midwest. Michigan and Wisconsin are really their strongholds. And then you get the populations out into Manitoba and disjunct populations even in the Black Hills high elevation meadows in uh, the Rockies. And historically, there was an isolated coastal population in Texas. Uh, it is probably no longer there. People have looked and have not found them. And there's even, it doesn't really show up here, a small population that was documented in uh, northern Mexico as well. Um, but really, the Northeast and Midwest is, is the stronghold for the species. Uh, so what's threatening them? What's causing this widespread decline? Well, the biggest cause is going to be habitat loss, habitat conversion. Most of the grassland habitat has been converted to row crop agriculture, even though this is technically an open canopy ecosystem. This is a tall uh, ecosystem in terms of vegetation structure. The snakes need low vegetation, open vegetation so they can bask as crops grow vertically. That's going to shade them out. They can't get the solar insulation that they need as ectotherms to kind of fuel their energy supply for the day so that they can catch insects. With intensive agriculture, you tend to have intensive application of insecticide, and these are insectivores. So you're losing the basking habitat and you're losing the prey base. They can't survive in that type of environment. Now, I mentioned that Wisconsin is one of their strongholds. If you think about the states where they are endangered, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, these are corn belt states. Ohio is a dairy state. Ohio had historically much more cattle grazing. They can do all right in pastures. They can coexist with grazing because the cattle are actually keeping that vegetation structure fairly low. So as long as they're not stepped on by a cow, they should be okay. They coexisted most likely in sites that had bison historically. So um, 
grazing is something that, that can, they can adapt to. So if you think of sites like Medeoin where there are bison, that kind of open condition, that's really what, they, what they're used to. They also are impacted by habitat fragmentation from urban and suburban sprawl. So even in areas that don't necessarily have the busiest roads, even a small, oops, I went back, there we go, uh, kind of small subdivision with roads like this is going to present multiple obstacles to migration if snakes want to get from point A to point B. This used to be connected wetland complex and grassland habitat. This is Hastings Lake and McDonald Woods in, uh, in Lake County. And getting across that network of roads is enough to, to really stop migration and separate these into two isolated populations. Another challenge um, that I mentioned a little bit earlier is that of being oviparous. Um, these snakes lay small clutches. They only produce between one and 14 eggs per female per year once they reach reproductive age. The younger females are gonna produce fewer eggs because they just don't have the energetic reserve that a larger older female would have. So on average, at peak reproductive output, they're producing 5.5 eggs per female per year. Um, usually they don't reproduce till they're about three, two or three years of age. So that's going to put them at a disadvantage compared to the larger egg laying snakes like the fox snake and the milk snake. First of all, those snakes are better able to colonize restored habitat. So even if you have a nice restoration site and a green snake manages to make its way there, they're not going to be able to kind of ramp up their reproductive potential to get that foothold and really establish a large population quickly in the way that some of the other snakes can. And we see brown snakes and red-bellied snakes as well as garter snakes colonize a lot of restorations fairly quickly. These are live bearers. They um, drop young in yolk sacs, but they're carrying the young the whole time. They don't have to find a suitable nest site. And they produce much more larger litters of young. They can produce upwards of 30 young in a single uh, season. So they have this, this greater potential for, for population growth. One of the other challenges with the green snake in particular is this unique trait of a very variable incubation length. And this is really one of the only snakes in the world that does this. They will retain the eggs when they can't find a, a thermally stable nesting site. So in the northern part of their range up in, in Manitoba, um, where they have a much shorter season, the females will retain the eggs until they're about four days away from hatching and then drop the eggs and it's this little short incubation window. The southern end of their range, they're going to drop the eggs early. They tend to incubate in the field about 30, 31 days and, um, and then they'll hatch. Here in Illinois, we see both ends of that spectrum within the same site. So I have sites where we're monitoring and within the same season, I'll get nests as early as June 23rd and then nests as late as August 4th and they'll still hatch around the same time. Um, mm -hmm. So is it latitude driving it? It doesn't seem like it here because we're seeing both ends of the spectrum in the same site. Is it the microhabitat? not if it's the same site. So what is driving it? Is it the mother's you know, nutritional status? Is it something else? Is that a genetic trait? Do um, females that have short incubation always have short incubation? We don't know that. That's information we're still trying to learn. But the longer those eggs stay out there, the more vulnerable they are to predators and to changes in environmental conditions in the nesting site. The other issue is that they often produce communal nests. That's really good for me when I'm looking for eggs and trying to find them and have them for stock for, for our uh, captive rearing or head starting efforts. But if a predator finds them, they could be gone in one fell swoop. So these are some factors about their natural history that, that can make it challenging um, to conserve the population. Other threats are poor nest success. I will go more into depth with this shortly. Uh, this is just a photo of one of the green snake nests that has developed mold and all the eggs have failed here. Another threat that uh, we don't know very much about at this point is snake fungal disease. How many of you have heard of snake fungal disease? 
Okay, it's new, new to everyone. This is an emerging pathogen. It's a, uh, driven by a fungus called Ophidiomyces ophidiocola. It was first documented in New York State in timber rattlesnakes. Um, it has really hit uh, the southern Illinois population of eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes quite severely, where if they are infected, it's about 95% mortality. Um, this fungus digests the skin. It, infects the heat sensing pits in the vipers, gets down to the bone, they can't feed, they can't hunt. Um, in other snakes, it's not always as severe an infection. Um, the shaded states in pink are states that where the fungus has been confirmed. There is surveillance that's starting up in Indiana and Pennsylvania. It probably is there. I doubt it hopped over those states to make its way here. Um, this is a garter snake with snake fungal disease that I found in McHenry County in a green snake site. This is a fox snake I found in DuPage County in a green snake site with fungal disease. Now, I'll tell you the happy news. Um, we worked with uh, Dr. Matt Allender from the University of Illinois Wildlife Epidemiology Lab. He was trying different treatment approaches. He took both of these snakes. He was able to clear the infection after uh, several courses of treatment with nebulizer, with antifungal compounds. Um, with garter snakes, after they shed a few times, you barely notice the infection. It looks like slightly displaced scales along the mouth. Um, with this fox snake, when we found it, it, it looked like it was hit by a weed whacker. Um, there was exposed jawbone. It was able to heal over and still be released. Um, we don't know what the survival rate of our local snakes is once they become infected with this fungus. Um, and again, this is present in our local area. It is in sites with green snakes. The fungus is free living in soil. so. <sighs> How do you control for that? You know, we do disinfection of all of our gear. We the only thing um, so far that's been effective at, at killing the fungus is to clean your boots in 10% bleach. Um, so I do foot baths between different sites when we're we know we're working in these different places because I don't want to be the source of transporting these pathogens around to new snake sites. Um, I have yet to see an infected green snake, but we did also find milk snakes with infections in Lake County last year. So it's, it's definitely around, and we have seen it in um, blue racers and garter snakes in Cook and Grundy County as well. Um, so I'll try to shift gears and put a more positive spin on, on things. How are we trying to help these snakes recover? What are we doing to try to, to improve the situation for them? Well, to recover any species of wildlife, the best thing that we can do is to try to conserve the habitat in the first place. And when we have the opportunity to restore the habitat to what it once was. And so we're partnering with different land management agencies who are doing widespread habitat restoration. Uh, we've been working with Lake County Forest Preserve District and the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County for a number of years on green snake conservation as well as McHenry County Conservation District. Um, and on my end of things, I really focus on integrating kind of experimental or comparative approaches into the techniques we use to learn which applied conservation techniques work best for these species. So we can try captive breeding and try to evaluate whether this is an effective strategy to help uh, provide stock for uh, supplementing existing green snake populations or reintroducing them to the habitat where they once occurred now that it's been restored, or we can try head starting. So the difference is captive rearing, we're collecting wild adults, bringing them into a captive setting, trying to get them to reproduce in this captive setting and get successive generations of snakes in this captive setting to provide stock. With head starting, we can temporarily bring in a reproductive female, hold her till she lays eggs, put her back out, and rear up her young because that juvenile life stage, that first year of life is where they have the highest mortality. Um, so we're getting them over that hurdle. This is commonly done with turtles. You've probably heard a lot about Blanding's turtle head starting. Um, we can also go look for wild nests, even if we don't find very many reproductive females. If we find nests, if they're within about 
uh, the first three days of development, then it's, it's fairly safe to carefully move them. Unlike bird eggs, which have chorionic fibers that anchor the embryo in place in the shell, you can turn bird eggs. You can't turn reptile eggs you, um, because they don't have those fibers. So if you change the orientation of those eggs, you can disrupt their developmental processes. They can end up with, with um, deformities, basically. So uh, that's why you shouldn't move turtle eggs, or if you do it, you have to do it very carefully and put them in the exact position they were. So you have about a three-day window um, once the eggs are, are deposited in the nest site um, where it's really safe to move them. Beyond that, I wouldn't recommend trying to shift them. So if I found them mid-season, mid-incubation, I wouldn't try to bring those nests in for incubation. I would just maybe cage them and monitor them. So the overall goals of our study are really to try to secure the smooth green snake population of the region. We have a couple of techniques and approaches that we use to do that. Uh, we sample, we do field surveys for um, existing populations. If we find populations, we try to do mark recapture analysis to try to estimate that population size and determine whether those uh, populations are growing decreasing or if they're stable. So we can identify which sites are most in need of conservation efforts and use our resources most effectively. Um, we're trying to improve the, our knowledge of where the snakes are currently distributed. We know a lot about where they were historically, but because they are so cryptic, because they're easy to overlook um, in a grassland as you're walking through it, it's easy to miss them. You have to do repeated surveys with equal effort to be sure that you are not finding them or, or that you're not just missing them. Um, as we do that, as we sample in these sites, we learn more and more about the threats that are out there impacting individual populations. Then we apply population models and habitat models to try to guide our conservation efforts so we know how many snakes we need to release, which sites are the best release sites. And then we can try supplementation of those existing populations to secure those. And then once those are secure and self-sustaining, then we can consider reintroducing them to places where, uh, where they historically occurred. And then we monitor, we do post-release monitoring so that we can see if our efforts were successful and we can try to adjust our techniques. If something isn't working, we can revisit it, reevaluate it, and try to improve on it. So how do we find these smooth green snakes? Well, we use a couple of different techniques. Um, the, the main technique we use is artificial cover surveys. So we put out transects through the grasslands of alternating plywood and rubber mats. Sometimes we incorporate tin. If it's a site that's visited by scrap metal collectors, we don't do that. Um, <laughs> so uh, often we will use plywood or rubber mats. Um, these objects will heat up in the field, they'll retain some heat, they'll retain some moisture, and they act as a little thermal oasis for the snakes. So they're trying to warm up, so they'll go under there. Their food, their, the insects will uh, kind of accumulate under there, so they'll sit there and feed and warm up for the day. So you can often find them under there in the morning or then in the afternoon when they're taking their post-lunch siesta. Um, we also use drift fences. This is a drift fence. It's kind of an artificial corral going through the habitat. So if you know that there are green snakes in a site, this is a more intensive effort to get more captures in a place where you know they're, that they're there. Um, so you would put this between maybe a savanna edge and a wet meadow or along a sedge meadow and a tall grass prairie, usually at a transition spot between two different ecosystems where uh, the snakes are likely to be moving back and forth. So the snakes are going to kind of go along and they're gonna hit this fence and then they're gonna try to get around it and we have funnel traps on the end of these arms so that we can get them from different directions. Um, so we only do that in a handful of sites where we're, we're just trying to increase our capture rates. We also do visual encounter surveys in the middle of the day when the snakes are more likely to just be out moving and foraging. So, oop, I hit the wrong one again, sorry. Here's a green snake moving through the grass. So you really have to <laughs> hold that searching edge. But um, this was probably my best day when I grabbed three juveniles that I happened to see in one spot in the grass in one grab. Um, so 
you, you really develop a good search image for them over time. Then once we actually find them, um, we collect a variety of morphometric data. So we're seeing how long they are. We measure their snout to vent length. Uh, we measure the tail length. That helps discern if they're male or female. The males have much longer tails than the females. We assess their reproductive condition. So we're feeling for eggs. Uh, we get body mass. Um, and then we give them an individual mark on their scales, on their ventral scales, and each scale corresponds to a unique number so that we know if we've caught the snake before, we know what year, where it was, and then we can get growth data, we can get survival data the next time we see this snake. So we've, at this point, sampled about 63 different um, restored and remnant grassland preserves intensively and only 25% or so, so that's about 15, 16 of them, <coughs> actually have green snake populations. Um, through this survey effort, as we've increased the, the coverage of our, our sampling, we found eight populations that people did not know about previously. So um, sometimes you're not finding them in the historic sites, but then you, you find populations in places where you never knew they were. Um, so that's always rewarding. But one of the interesting things about them is that they're highly colonial and kind of patchy in their distribution. So you could have a beautiful site, it's really high quality, and the snakes are in this one area. If you flip that log, if you hang around by this down tree, they're all over there. If you go 50 meters away, you're not going to pick them up. That's why we use kind of linear transects of boards to sample as much microhabitat as possible and cover as much ground as possible. This kind of patchy colonial um, aggregation behavior that they do makes them subject to, um, to burn frequency, burn extent. If you burn the entire site in a given year, um, that's going to push them out to the kind of edges of the site, marginal habitat that isn't as good for them. So we always recommend burning in a mosaic pattern. If you're going to do a prescribed burn, leave cover for them, leave some down logs for them, um, rotate where you're burning from year to year because they need the ability to come <coughs> back. They don't move very far. And again, they don't have this great reproductive potential to quickly um, bounce back. They're not as resilient as the other species. One thing that we found is an interesting pattern is that uh, they will use railroad right-of-ways and power line right-of-ways. They use the ballast along the train tracks, often to nest or den. They use the vegetation strips along the train tracks or under the power lines as corridors to go between different sites. And you'll even turn them up on occasion in lower quality sites, mitigation sites where you really don't expect them, but if there's a train track going through it that connects them to a place that has remnant vegetation, that's probably where they're coming from and they're just using this as a landscape corridor to get from point A to point B. Another thing we found is that they have a strong association in terms of uh, similar microhabitat with the plains garter snake. So um, they're similar to common garter snakes, it's kind of hard to see, but they have a little dot on top of the head right there, um, a boulder stripe, the lateral stripe are on scale rows three and four instead of two and three, if you count scale rows on snakes. <laughs> um, but uh, they're, they're helpful in that if I find a plains garter snake in a given site, that's gonna tell me there's a good chance that there are green snakes there and it's probably wor a site worth revisiting. It also tells me that the habitat is probably suitable as a potential release site because they share a lot of microhabitat features and um, they like slightly wetter uh, prairie sites than the common garter snakes do. Um, so we've also seen, as I mentioned earlier, this incubation length um, that varies. We find it varies often with our weather. So in a hotter year, you're going to have a shorter <coughs> incubation window. They're using up the resources in the egg more quickly. Their metabolism is going to speed up. In a colder year, they're going to have a longer incubation time. So that's going to, again, increase that susceptibility to predation or mold. Um, and variation in their wild nest success can really change the population growth rate. And we'll take a look at that in a moment. Um, 
I'm going to shift and talk a bit about what we do in terms of captive breeding. Um, most of this uh, captive rearing work was done when the uh, project was at Lincoln Park Zoo uh, <coughs> earlier. Um, and at the zoo we were trying to reduce common sources of mortality, so by keeping them in captivity away from predators, you're keeping them safe from being eaten, you're keeping them safe from severe winters, kind of in a constant environment. And the idea there is to try to increase their growth rate, um, get them to breed, keep the environment as natural as possible. Um, some of the challenges to rearing the snake in captivity is their diet. Um, they're very small when they hatch, and so it's hard to get commercially produced you know, wax worms and crickets that are small enough for them to successfully ingest without a problem. Um, and it has to be prey that's big enough that they recognize that it's something they want to eat. If you try something like a fruit fly, they're not even going to look at it. So it's, it, they're finicky. We had to go through a bunch of different prey options before we, we found a good combination of things. They're also a diurnal snake. They're active during the hottest part of the day. They like ultraviolet. They need full spectrum uh, radiation. So we have to really provide all of their, their UV requirements. One of the uh, comparative questions that I was particularly interested in, um, in terms of uh, head starting the young, so once we have young either from captive rearing or from eggs that have been brought in, um, typically with reptiles in these head starting programs, commonly with turtles especially, um, you skip hibernation. And the thought is that when reptiles hibernate, you have to put them through a fasting period. They're not eating, so they're not going to grow. Um, that seems like it's Kind of working against your goal of increasing body size, increasing growth rate, um, there's also always a risk of mortality when an animal fasts and overwinters. In the wild, about 10% on average of uh, one-year-old snakes or first-year snakes make it through their first winter. Um, it's pretty low survival rate. So um, people typically skip this. They keep the reptiles active year-round. However, um, Bruce Kingsbury, who's a researcher in Indiana, uh, he and his postdoc had done uh, some research with northern water snakes and they tried uh, head starting them in a lab and they kept them active year round. And these are big enough snakes that you can implant radio transmitters. And they released them in a, a site that had resident population of water snakes. And so they were comparing their survival and movement to the wild resident snakes. And he found that the snakes that were kept active in the lab tended to just sit out as the temperature started dropping because they had never had that thermal cue. So they didn't take adequate cover. A lot of them died of exposure. Um, you would think it's something that's fairly innate, but it was a, a surprisingly large proportion of the snakes did not respond to that change in ambient condition. So yes, they're bigger, but are they well adapted to their environment? No. Um, another question I had was about the impact on reproduction. So during hibernation or overwintering, this is when the snakes start devoting more resources to spermiogenesis and oogenesis. Is there going to be any kind of lag effect or lasting impact on their reproductive output if you skip that cue in their first year? We, we don't know. Um, so the first year of this study, we decided, let's try, let's overwinter half of the snakes, keep the other half active, see what happens, compare their growth, compare their reproductive potential, compare their survival, and see which approach makes sense for this species. <coughs> um, so to assess their reproductive potential, we palpate them for eggs. We can also radiograph them if we think that they have eggs that so you can kind of see. Here's one egg. Here's another egg. We take cloacal smears um, and then look at that under a microscope to check for presence of spermatozoa. And from the one-year-old snakes that we put through hibernation, um, we did find that they started producing unfertilized eggs, but that's early for a snake to be um, a head start snake to be producing eggs. Um, the males were producing spermatozoa and um, at two and a half years old, we got our first viable clutch from a hibernated head start. 
um, and we started seeing more of these you know early clutches of eggs being formed we didn't see any reproductive activity in the snakes that were kept active until they were three and a half years old and those were snakes that had natural light cues so they had this kind of seasonal fluctuation but they were staying active but we did start seeing eggs after three and a half years so there is a difference in reproductive output the earlier these snakes start breeding, the greater the potential for the population to grow. Um, one of the really interesting things we found was a pattern in growth rate where, of course, the snakes that were going through hibernation, they fasted over a couple of months, so they dropped in body mass, they're living off of fat reserves, while the active snakes continued to feed and their body, their body mass continued to increase. When we warmed up the hibernated snakes, we expected them to kind of continue on that same trajectory. But what we found was that within two months following warm up, the hibernated snakes caught up to the body mass of the ones that had been active. They just started eating like crazy and it's called compensatory growth. Not only did they catch up, but the females that had gone through hibernation, um, if we follow them out, to the following November, they end up 11% larger on average than the females that have been active and feeding all year. So that growth advantage kind of goes out, out the window. Um, we found no difference in size with males. Males end up about half the body size of females generally in snakes. And um, the males that had been hibernated and the ones that were kept active ended up the same size. So. We saw comparable, we also saw comparable survival. We did certainly a shorter hibernation window than what they experience in nature, but um, it, so it was a little bit mild, but everybody made it through. Everyone survived that window. Um, we had our hibernated snakes pr reproducing earlier, some breeding success with active snakes, but it's delayed. One of the interesting things we found with some of the wild snakes actually was that they can delay fertilization. So we had wild snakes that came in gravid with eggs. They laid eggs in captivity. We had them housed by themselves and then they produced more eggs and those were viable eggs. And it wasn't parthenogenesis because we had both males and females. These are not just all female kind of clones of mom without fertilization. This is stored spermatozoa that they're holding in their oviducts from previous matings. That's gonna make it hard to do a captive breeding program because you can pair snakes and not necessarily know that these are the offspring of a given male. You can also pair snakes and have successful mating but not see the results for several seasons. So it's a challenge to work with them. So once we have stock um, for release, for supplementation, or for reintroduction, we rank release sites using habitat suitability models. I won't go too much into depth with this. I just kind of wanted to give you an overview of what this looks like. Within each of these preserves, so this is Lake County Forest Preserves, um, we rank the different habitat types, so places that have sedge meadow and oak savanna and higher acreage are going to have a higher score than places that are closed canopy or more recent restoration versus remnant. So it's like if you're shopping for real estate and you're looking for a house that has maybe three bedrooms and two bathrooms and you find one that has three bedrooms and one bathroom, you could still live there. It might not be as great as the one you were looking for. You can still survive. So you're basically scoring the preserves in kind of a similar way. And then we're scoring the neighborhood. So you want to be near the things you need. You want to be able to get to the places you want to go. So we're, we're uh, scoring how well connected the habitat surrounding the preserves is. So for example, all of these preserves along the Des Plaines River have very high connectivity. Um, this is a, what we call a cost distance surface, so it's the cost to the snake of crossing it. So the darker the color is, the more costly, the more challenging it is for the snake to uh, cross that landscape. So you can have places like down here at Buffalo Creek Reservoir that score highly in terms of the amount of grassland habitat, but they're kind of cut off from some of the other preserves and right near a really busy road, so it's going to score lower. So this is the type of approach that we're using when we're ranking um, these habitats. We're looking for places that have habitat, have the area, and have that proximity to at least some stepping stone corridors 
corridors can include rivers, railroad tracks, power lines, as well as just other preserves or land uses with lower road density. So then once we release the snakes, um, we can ask some more questions. We can see um, how the snakes do with acclimation. So when we do reintroduction, you can um, put the snakes into some sort of temporary enclosure in the place where you're going to release them, give them a chance to get used to the cues of the site, give them a chance to catch their own food, but still be protected from predators. So we provision these enclosures with water, but they catch the insects in there on their own. Um, they have a, uh, access to vegetation within these enclosures. The walls are kind of trenched into the ground. And then um, over time, after a couple of weeks, we turn them completely loose. And so what we're hoping for is that these enclosures will establish some fidelity to the release site. Um, they're thought to help curtail a lot of wandering behavior that we see in, in wildlife translocations. The problem with wandering is that the animal's going to expend energy looking for something familiar and not necessarily finding it. Instead, they might find a predator. Instead, they might find a road some other form of mortality. So acclimation is thought to really help buffer against some of these, these uh, threats to them. Um, it's also thought to increase the ease of monitoring because the more likely they are to stay in the place where you put them, the better survival data you can get. If you can see that they're still there, that they're persisting, um, then you can evaluate whether your release worked or not. So um, we did, uh, releases with acclimation and then with a subset of snakes we just release them out in the same vicinity but not in the enclosures um, and then we radio track them and we radio tracked wild, a subset of wild snakes in the same area to compare their movement and survival because these snakes were essentially naive they'd only ever been in captivity so those first few weeks after release that's going to be a critical time to see if they're going to survive or not um, these are, oops, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button. Uh, these little points, I know it's a little hard to see, are all of the locations for the snakes, and you'll notice that clustering I talked about. Um, all the snakes, regardless of whether they had acclimation or not, remained within 40 meters of the place where we released them. Um, if they were wild, they stayed within about 30, 40 meters of the place where we caught them. Now this was post-nesting. Nesting females do make kind of longer linear movements, um, but these were not, you know, the head-started snakes were not reproductive yet. So they're just kind of hunkering down, laying down scent trails in the places where they were released. Um, their average home range size was only 30 square meters. That is very similar to the home range for the rough green snake, which is their arboreal cousin. Um, we did not see any difference in their movements with release type. So our wild snakes moved a little bit further, about 6.8 square meter, or meters per day. Without acclimation, the snakes moved about 2.2 meters per day. The ones that had acclimation moved about a meter and a half per day. It was the easiest radio tracking I've ever done. I had just walked over here, down the snake, walked over here. Usually you have to go a lot further and spend much more time looking for the animal. So you, you do see some benefit to acclimating, um, but we were seeing similar survival rates. Uh, so 83% of our head certs that we released the first year survived following release. We didn't see a difference between acclimated and non-acclimated snakes. Um, both groups, we had some small mammal predation, likely from shrews. Uh, so shrews are big predators of snakes, small big predators of snakes. Um, they take advantage of the, the times when the snakes are cold and they'll just chew them. So they're a big source of winter mortality. They get into some of the burrows that the snakes use for hibernation and they can they can do a lot of damage. Um, so we also started to see that we had more recaptures of acclimated snakes. So our, our uh, decision going forward is to continue using acclimation with these species. Um, so then we use population viability analysis, and this is going to allow us to estimate the population growth rate as we collect data under uh, various conditions. It's going to allow us to see how population growth rates change as environmental conditions change. So in a drought year, how do they do? In a flood year, how do they do? Um, it's going to let us look at the effect of 
releasing head starts on a wild population or supplementing a wild population to see how that's going to change their population trajectory. It's also going to help inform us to tell us how many snakes we should try to release in order to get that population up to a viable level where it's self-sustaining. And it's going to help us identify stages of their life cycle that are the most important to focus on, the ones that are gonna contribute most to overall population growth. And so with green snakes, when we do these analysis, we, uh, analyses, we see that first year survival is going to have the greatest impact on the population growth rate. So that's why we're, we have so much focus on the nests, getting them through nesting, getting them to one year old. Um, without going too much into the weeds with this, this is what our, our population model for uh, green snakes looks like. We break them up into age classes and then um, this row is the re average reproductive output for females, the fecundity, and then we have uh, survival rates on this diagonal. So it's survival from age zero to one, from age one to two, two to three, and so forth. And so this rate, um, this transition from age zero to one, it's saying that there's about 17.5% chance that they are making that transition. Now that rate is going to be a combination of the egg survival rate and the hatchling survival through the winter to the next year. So that's a combined probability. It has these two components. So we're trying to find out what the egg survival rates are like in the field. Um, so to do that, we sample for nests in these 63 different sites. Um, when we find nests, we sample them and check on them every three days. And we do this so that we can compare the success of these eggs in the field to what we get when we bring eggs in, ex situ situation, uh, bring them into a captive setting in an incubator where situ the uh, conditions are constant, and we can compare their success to how we did with our captive sired nests. So overall, um, we've been doing nest surveys since 2014, you can see based on the number of nests that we're getting better and better at finding these nests. Um, and we're finding more and more eggs, um, which is a good thing. Um, some of this is search image. And, um, but over time, our average hatching success in the field is only 43%. So less than half of the eggs are actually hatching successfully. And then we have a pretty low likelihood that those hatchlings are gonna survive the winter. Remember that combined probability is about 17.5%. Um, so you see we hit a low in 2015. We had 194 eggs that we were monitoring in about 12 different sites. Only 19% of those eggs survived. Um, but last year, in contrast, we had 65% it was a much wetter year. If you remember, July was much wetter. Um, most of these years, it was wet when they started nesting, and then July, the first two weeks of July, we had no rain. And that affected these eggs uh, quite strongly. So in 2016 and 2017, we started removing about 50% of these eggs that we were finding in wild nests to incubate um, so that we could make a dent have these direct comparisons with, with the same um, genetic lineage of snakes, the same, you know, same parentage of these snakes from these nests, um, leaving half in the field, taking half to incubate, and so we can make a direct comparison there. So if we look at the different sources of egg mortality of the ones that failed, 73% of the failure was due to conditions in the nest site. Typically, it's desiccation. Often, it's mold. So the dry years, you have eggs shriveling up. The wet years, you have eggs developing mold. Uh, about 19 to 24% of the mortality is due to invertebrate predation. So unlike turtles, that most of the nest predation is due to raccoons and skunks, it's insects often picking off these eggs. Um, Occasionally we have an unknown predator, but we'll look at some of the predators in a second. And then 7% uh, are kind of weird curveballs. Uh, we've had a couple of occasions of plants that actually germinate through wow. an egg. And as they destroy that egg, they, the eggs are cohesive, they're stuck together 
So as the moisture is being taken from that central one, all of them just start shriveling up. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. And within a given nest, the fate can really vary. So I, I know I mentioned desiccation, so I, it's a little hard to see here, but this is uh, an about to hatch, but completely desiccated, almost baby snake, right there next to one that is successfully poking its little snout out. Um, this is a moldy nest. Um, this is one that ants are in the process of destroying. So, what predators have we documented? Definitely ants. Ants are a big one. Um, they bury the nest when they're brooding. They often will brood under the same logs and cover objects that the snakes use. They get really aggressive when they brood, so they just kind of spread out and anything in their path they tend to, to bury, um, but they will actively feed on them as well. Termites do a similar thing. So this is showing how they, they bury those eggs. Um, ground beetles, sorry, that's a little blurry. Um, you've got a ground beetle pulling them out from under a board and, and uh, chewing on them. Last year, we discovered that carrion beetle larvae also feed on the eggs. And these were not you know, bad eggs. These were viable the day before. And here are these carrion beetle larvae just picking them off. Crickets, less likely, um, but on occasion you'll see them chewing. I don't know if they're initially just taking moisture and then just end up biting through the egg and they keep going. So that's your, your circle of life. The snakes eat the crickets, the crickets eat the snake eggs. Um, shrews, again, um, we know that they feed on adults, but sometimes green snakes do things like this. Here's a shrew nest. <laughs> Here's a green snake nest. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's nice and moist and sheltered under that shrew nest. And if that's an active shrew nest, mama shrew might make quick work of those eggs. So oftentimes we don't see what actually happens. Those eggs just disappear. So, but if they're under a shrew nest, I'm making the leap that a shrew is probably eating them. Um, <coughs> the, the, the eggs are white, so they, they're not can yeah, they're not camouflaged. They're usually um, under some vegetation, but sometimes they're in just little indentations in the soil. And in really dry years, I'll see that where the soil starts to crack, they'll actually lay the eggs in the cracks in the soil or partially out of crayfish burrows and somewhat submerged. They're aware that moisture is an issue when they're laying these eggs. Um, I found one nest in an old piece of wood, like an old uh, two by four out in a field, there was a little knot hole in the two by four and I, I kind of saw something white, I thought maybe it was a mushroom and we flipped the log over and there were eggs in this little knot hole in the wood. Um, so millipedes and slugs, this is an interesting one. These are detritivores, they usually just eat fungus. Um, I think what's happening in this situation is that they are feeding on mold growing on the surface of the egg, but in the process of doing that, they're making holes in the egg. Um, because, and, and it might be the, the similar thing with slugs. We see slugs crawling over the surface of the egg and they might be taking moisture, but those rasping mouth parts that they have or potentially some of the enzymes in the slime trail might be causing some, some thin spots mm. dissolving part of the eggshell. Um, we find this. So it's just this gaping hole in the egg and clearly the snake is no longer with us, but it's still there. So a mammal didn't do that, an ant didn't do that, a beetle didn't do that. They would have finished it off and that wouldn't just be sitting there like that. Um, so it's, it's accidental perhaps, but it, it is a source of mortality. Um, here's another one I, I found um, where so much of the eggshell was destroyed, it just kind of desiccated in there, but then here's a little sibling coming out just fine. Um, it's not always a, uh, a death sentence when you get these holes in the eggs. Um, this year in DuPage County, I found some eggs like this, where the snake is still in the amniotic sac. You can see some of the vascularization, he turned around, looked at me, I brought him to uh, Willowbrook Wildlife Center and incubated him there and he, he came out just fine. 
here's one of his siblings in the field coming out of um, an egg that had multiple holes. And I, I didn't know if that one was still viable. It was under some of the other eggs. I didn't want to disturb them. But lo and behold, um, let's see if I can get this to play. So you can see that egg has a bunch of holes in it. And see how dark they are when they hatch? They, they still blend in really well with that substrate. Um, that's why they're not bright green. They kind of go into the duff layer, to the organic layer, um, and the dead vegetation and disappear pretty quickly. And there's an ant trying to bother him already. So definitely hard to spot once they disappear into the vegetation. Um, so if we compare that, all of those you know, sources of mortality to how they do when we incubate them, you're gonna see a very different story. Um, we've incubated 44 wild-sired nests, totaling 436 eggs since 2010. Our hatching success is 93%. Um, so we've had 407 out of 436 eggs hatch across clutches. It breaks down to an average of about 86% per clutch. Um, so they're definitely getting an advantage there. If we look at how that compares to in captivity, again, a very different story. Um, from 2011 to 2015, we had captive snakes that produced 25 nests, totaling 76 eggs. Many of these eggs were not viable. Um, they just didn't really develop, became moldy, some of them weren't fertilized. Um, in comparison, you can kind of see by the numbers, these are smaller clutch sizes. In the field, again, our average is 5.5 eggs per female. In captivity, we're getting about three eggs per female. Um, hatching success, 13% across clutches, it's about 11%. We did have some viable eggs from that, but just not not that many. Um, so we can see using those population <coughs> models how this impacts their population growth. So here is just a chart showing our average highest and lowest egg survival in the field with wild sired but ex situ incubated eggs and then from captive rearing. And you can see that if we just look at the averages, bringing the eggs in, incubating them, we're doubling what, what their success is in the field, and um, it's, it's about eight times higher than what we get with captive rearing. Um, now remember, this is a combined survival rate with that the neonates, the hatchlings. They still have to survive the winter. Um, our best estimates of that survival ranges from 7 to 17 percent, but our recapture data right now is pretty limited. They're so small, you don't find them very easily. Um, so it's probably an underestimate, but again, most snakes, it's about 10 percent survival for the first win winter, so that's not totally outlandish to have that 7 to 17 percent range. Um, in contrast, if we hold those hatchlings and rear them for the next year and put them through hibernation, our average survival rate across the last several years has been about 72%. They don't all make it, some of them don't thrive, but the ones that do really kick into gear and we're really bumping up that survival rate. Um, so we can plug those in and into our model and we can tweak what that hatchling survival rate is to see how high does hatchling sur overwintering survival have to be to have stable population size. So if we look at a population growth rate, if it's stable, it's gonna be one. If it's declining, it's gonna be less than one. If the population's growing, the rate is gonna be greater than one. So all the ones that are in bold result in a growing <coughs> population. So we can set in our model 100% of the hatchlings to survive. Unlikely, but you're going to get, uh, even with our average field survival, you'll get a growing population rate. Obviously, with uh, ex situ incubation, you get a growing population rate. 
you can drop that down to 50% of them surviving. You still have a growing population or, um, with the field nest survival and with ex situ incubation. You can drop it down to 25. They're no longer growing. Now the ones in the field are declining. But if we still incubate those eggs, that's still a growing population. So we can toggle those numbers and figure out what that tipping point is. So for average field nest survival, we need a minimum of 45% of the young to survive the winter in order to maintain stable population size, given the hatching rates that we have seen. Again, we're seeing roughly 7 to 17%. So that's not great. Um, with average incubated nest survival, that drops down to 20%. That's the tipping point. That's within that range that we were looking at. With captive sired nest survival, the success is just too low to really offset that decline. So it can't be a standalone method. So if we take a step back and look at our directions for where we want to go with these conservation strategies, we see that nest survival in the field is greatly influenced by abiotic factors, the nest conditions, the humidity, as well as predation. So this season, we got a small grant to do an experiment where we're uh, ex examining evaporative water loss. We're making plaster molds of the eggs and putting out humidity and temperature loggers in active nest sites. We're going to be weighing the eggs. We, we dry them first, get a dry weight, saturate them in water to get the saturated weight. And then each time we check um, the nest site, we weigh these plaster eggs again to see how much water they're losing or gaining as we have um, data being collected with these temperature and humidity loggers. At the same time, we're monitoring actual eggs and seeing what's happening to them. And so we can use that data to uh, determine a threshold for humidity and nest conditions and help identify which sites are reproductive sinks versus reproductive sources and focus our incubation efforts on the places where we're continuing to see net loss instead of net gain. Our ex situ incubation uh, is clearly providing a benefit even with only 20% of young surviving. Um, oh, look how cute he is. He's so happy. <laughs> um, captive breeding, um, it's producing a lower reproductive output for this species than they would have in the wild. So the question is, is it worth bringing them in and trying to breed them? If that is your only option, you only have two snakes left, it might be better than nothing, but um, I don't think it's, it's necessarily the best use of resources maintaining captive breeding program. It's time, money, um, and uh, just a lot, of, a lot of effort to not necessarily get the best reproductive output if they can do better in the field let's help them in the field. Um, so we can use it if we need to, if we can figure out ways to improve upon it, figure out is there something dietary that they're missing, maybe a light cue that they're missing. We wanna figure out um, if that could be used to supplement the other approaches, but it's not going to suffice as a standalone method. You can't just do a captive rearing program and have stock for reintroduction. Um, it's just not going to be effective. So, um, all in all, we see these surveys for the gravid females and the nest is requiring less time, less cost than maintaining the breeding programs. We see that just incubating the eggs is going to counter some of those challenges to oviparity, some of the threats that they're facing. And if we couple that with head starting, with holding the young um, until the successive season, then we can really increase that first year survival rate and change the trajectory to stabilize the population growth rate. Uh, so we need to still collect more neonate survival data. So in DuPage County, we're not holding the snakes as they hatch um, from the incubators. We're measuring and marking each one, and then we're releasing them out. So the more marked baby snakes we have on the landscape, the better our odds are at getting at that actual survival rate that we're, we're really trying to determine. Um, so we're doing continued surveillance for snake fungal disease. We're also doing regional analysis of where we're seeing snakes and um, kind of timeline of occurrence in response to extent of fire and f prescribed fire interval. So are we burning too frequently? Are we not burning frequently enough? How does extent of fire impact where we're finding these snakes? And this past year, we expanded our surveys into some of the Citizens for Conservation um, 
sites in the Barrington area to some uh, Cook County uh, Nature Conservancy sites and out to DeKalb County Forest Preserves. Um, and we've been really trying to work on increasing regional partnerships for monitoring, head starting, as well as disease surveillance. So um, all of these people helped, um, mostly an army of interns uh, who have been great at finding uh, nests and helping me check nests every three days during <laughs> incubation season. Um, can't do it without them. And uh, Lake County and DuPage County, for uh, especially for their continued support, as well as McHenry County. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. What's the average lifespan? Good question. We think it's about seven years. Um, we don't know in the wild. We, don't, we haven't caught an individual successively each year of the study, so I don't necessarily have anyone I caught the first year that I caught last year. Um, but sometimes you go two years without seeing a snake and then you find it again. So it may be longer than that um, because they don't really reproduce in the field until they're about two or three. So it makes sense for them to live a little bit longer. Um, and captive snakes, probably about six years. So, yeah. Yes. You mentioned a um, <coughs> uh, problem with insecticides. Yeah. Um, in the, terms of the, the, does the problem occur from the reduced number of insects or even the, the insects that have the insects? It's a good question. Um, there hasn't been any study of direct mortality or direct effect of insecticide on green snakes. Um, we know that its, it's prey-based limitation is the big problem. Um, they are small-bodied. They do eat a lot of insects, so you could certainly have a bioaccumulation effect, um, but that hasn't been do documented at this point. I know a lot of people ask me about that, and, oh, is insecticide killing the thing? Yeah, we don't have so evidence good. that it's causing direct mortality, but there, there's certainly an indirect effect by prey limitation. Right. Um, Do you have any suspicions? I have uh, one, one incident where um, someone who was mowing at a preserve saw a snake and picked one up and he had deet all over his, oh. his arms and picked the snake up and said, hey, I found a snake and it was limp very shortly after. Now, I don't, he could have potentially hit the snake with the mower. I mean, it looked intact. Um, I don't want to necessarily jump to that conclusion, but that's the, the only real direct evidence that observation that I've seen of, you know, somebody who had, you know, an insecticide on their hands picking it up and the snake succumbing to it. Mm -hmm. Yes? The fire, will it survive if they're deep enough in the soil? In other words, if the fire yeah. is cool enough or... Yeah, um, they, they go a couple meters down. So um, it's, it's more of a question of, I would say, later. Meters? Yeah, yeah. Um, people have excavated some of those ant mounds mm -hmm. and gone down two to three meters and found green snakes down there. Um, so I think they're sufficiently below um, that if you're doing a burn once they're under, you're okay. Um, they're fast snakes. Um, it's not to say I haven't seen burned ones. I have. Um, so it's the I would say the later spring burns are probably you know this time of year it gets uh, a little risky because I mean we've seen garter snakes up since probably early March um, here and there. Those warm days. I know uh, someone saw a green snake in Southern Cook County last Thursday. Um, and they're slow. These come out much later than murder snakes. Well, a green snake last Thursday. So April is typical. Someone, uh, someone saw one in Southern Cook County in February when they were felling ash trees at a site. Now, I think that was a case of the, their hibernacula got disturbed when they were, they were doing work and the snake came out. I've never heard of one being active in February before. Um, but I would say, you know, March, you're probably fine. Late April, you're getting into emergence time. Yes? So um, there was a, a map earlier that where you're talking about the threats of um, one, one of the threats is the loss of habitat and fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And you showed that suburban. Oh, um, yeah. 
Yeah. And there, there were like two forest preserves with ponds on mm -hmm. two sides and then a, a suburban track. So you said that if a, a snake wanted to migrate, so I was just wondering how far it might want to migrate or, or Yeah, so, so from our radio tracking study, which was post nesting season, we only saw these kind of short moves okay. and they stayed usually within 40 meters of their area now during nesting season. Um, the females do make kind of long distance dispersals. Um, we haven't tracked a nesting female um, from rough green snakes, which is their closest relative and they're about a foot longer so you can track them for a little bit more readily. Um, I think the dispersal distance was, was maybe about 100 meters for nesting females. Um, males will, uh, I think, disperse a little bit more early season. You tend to see them along the railroad tracks and things like that. It, when, when I catch ones you know, in, in those corridors, the power lines and the train lines, it's, it tends to be more males than females moving. Um, so well, The thing that I was thinking is yeah. when they're doing these um, conservation actions of trying to um, if you have like a bunch of babies, you will bring them back to a place that has a better chance. So do you put them in a larger forest preserve where they have a better chance of yeah, so what, what we've been really focused on is supplementing the existing populations mm -hmm. at this point, and we, we do that back to, where you're to the nest about. sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we do that in part because those populations are not entirely secure, even though we're seeing reproduction. The rep you know, the, the, we're still seeing a lot of nest failure. Um, we're not seeing the levels of green snakes that, that people have seen historically, where you, know, you walk and you just see green wow. scurrying. Um, but uh, when you're cons you know, considering a reintroduction, we are going to do an experimental one this year. Um, we're, we're looking for the, the area in the habitat types they like, as well as the connectivity. So, right, so you want to have that lower like, prairie that's a higher quality that's not too tall. Right. If you can get remnant, great. If it's a high quality restoration with burns managed in a mosaic fashion and it has a mix of sedge meadow and savanna, um, tall grass prairie, if it has some sort of corridor in it like a train line, like a river, like a creek that might connect it to additional habitats, that's going to rank higher in our population models than, let's say, um, a large site that's necessarily by itself. But there are different the the elements of those get weighed differently. Like historically, had them, but now you don't have it anymore. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so we we don't release them in places where they never occurred. We don't we don't reintroduce them outside their range. It's always two places that once supported them, where we have, you know, historical vouchers that they were in this area. Um, so. You know, um, we use museum specimens, and, and the museum is certainly great that way. Um, using Chicago Academy of Sciences collections, we're able to go back and see because a lot of the collection is focused on our our region specifically. We can look and see, you know, oh, Kennecott collected a green snake here in 1868. You know, um, and we we do have those data handy, and certainly with the field museum also has some some excellent records um, and natural history surveys <coughs> too. So, we try to get um, a historic map of what the distribution once was, and then we're revisiting those sites, seeing if the snakes are still there, and then if they're not, that's on our list of potential release sites. The habitat still exists and has been restored. Um, so yeah. is, there a, um, is there a process that you go through to um, apply for um, you know, uh, putting snakes in, into an area? Uh, in terms of permitting? Or, or, um, or just the whole, the whole general process? I mean, uh, we in have terms virtually of, all the habitat here. Yeah. Rails so, and so, what, so what I would start with is baseline surveys. So you know, getting transacts of cover boards set out, doing some baseline monitoring, seeing what's there in the first place. Um, because right now, since we're focusing on really supplementing the existing mm -hmm. sites, we, and, we, and we're not doing captive breeding at this point in time, we don't have stock to put in sites that don't have snakes at this point in time. 
once we secure populations through supplementation, then we're kind of considering moving on to the reintroduction as an experimental context. Mm -hmm. But if you find green snakes on your site, the next thing I would do is then, you know, I could help set up like a nest monitoring protocol mm -hmm. and try to see are they reproducing in your site already. If they are, are those, you know, are those nests a net gain or are you losing more how can we improve the nesting habitat it yeah. may be adding large diameter logs things like that and um, kind of going to, from there and evaluating because there are sites that you know we they weren't on a radar we found a few sites in the Henry County that um, had no records I mean they were in the historic range but we didn't have detailed records that green snakes were ever there and we found quite a few and they were breeding and the nests were doing well so that's a site that then can maybe provide stock for neighboring sites within the county within that that jurisdiction mm -hmm. okay. yeah. sure and and then for permitting um, I should say any um, release project with experimental reintroduction is going to require five years post-release monitoring um, as a requirement by the state for uh, any HERP release, you know, yeah. reintroduction projects. Mm -hmm. How did you choose your field? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, I would say that my parents were probably a big influence. Um, they used to take us hiking into national parks and things and my dad was always uh, especially into amphibians and reptiles um, and uh, I actually have some old film of my grandfather's where my dad is like holding transforming newts but uh, my parents gave us a let's see we had a frog high chair <laughs> so, so um, you know you had this the sense as a, a child of a frog is providing you nourishment so you should you should you know do the same for them later but uh now my, uh, my brother and and i used to go look for you know look for um herps in, in we, we grew up in new york and uh look around there and um my parents uh, are very tolerant people and uh, even tolerated guess what amphibian is on your face as a game to wake them up on weekend mornings <laughs> so uh, yeah they, they just encouraged this so yeah, <laughs> yeah. before you were saying that um, you, when you want to capture them you put up a barrier at mm -hmm. a place where it goes from one habitat type to another habitat type. Yeah. Why do they want to go from one habitat type to another? Because over the course of the day, they're going to be using kind of different different areas, like if they're feeding. And they make small movements, but um, you know when they're foraging or when they're looking for mates, the males will kind of zigzag along. If it gets really hot, they're going to leave you know the, the middle of the tall grass prairie and kind of get a little bit of shade. So they go into the savanna edge. They'll go where there's some logs for cover. Um, they'll feed around the uh, you know the little wet areas, the sedge meadows within the tall grass prairie or little prairie pools, um, because there's going to be a higher insect density around the water. So those ecotones are good spots to just try to intercept them during um, you know, during emergence when they're coming up and first trying to feed and when they're looking for mates. It's another thing we think they're fall breeders. Um, some species breed both in spring and fall. Um, I, I think that the, most of them are breeding in September, October, and then overwintering. Um, so when we saw clutches at the, at the zoo, we tended to see them in fall, and we weren't usually over starting the cool down for overwintering until November. And every so often, you'd all of a sudden I'm like that snake looks gravid, palpate her, and she's got eggs, and it's November. I think normally they're breeding, but then they're delaying fertilization till after hibernation. So have these these tricky things that are hard to you know these parts of their life cycle that you want to get them on the same schedule as what they'd be dealing with outside, and that's that's very hard to replicate. And is the fungus um, an invasive thing, or is it natural fluctuation? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it's probably been here. Um, I mean, people have reported, you know, scale rot, hibernation blisters, for a long time. Um, 
snakes get lesions on them when they come out if they're if they've gone into crayfish burrows for overwintering and they're just kind of hanging out in the water table which they do they'll come up and they'll have rotting scales um, there was an effort by uh, folks in Illinois Natural History Survey to uh, go back to specimen the first specimen that they remember seeing that had hibernation blisters and and it turned out I think it was around 2004 that that they could tell that it was fungal disease, not just some you know scale rot. Um, given that it seems like it's showing up everywhere, um, I don't think that it's necessarily an invasive species. I think it's you know it's a, an immune issue, and maybe they're immune suppressed. Maybe there's enough kind of stressors acting. Um, synergistically that that they're succumbing to it um, because I mean we, we're finding it all over the place so, um, so it doesn't exist back in the historical record right? I mean if if you went into um, museum specimens and looked through you'd probably find some blisters but I don't know how far you could go back and still find fungal spores people have done that with chytrid fungus I should say uh, uh, Brooke Talley wrote a paper, um, I think in 2015, where she went back through Illinois frog specimens, and the earliest specimen that was positive for chytrid was from 1899 or 1900, and it was mm -hmm. a southern leopard frog. So fungus has been here that long, but we're not really seeing die-offs until much later, until like the 1970s. So mm -hmm. what's changed in the environment? Is it multiple invasive species that they're dealing with? Is it pesticides? Is it fragmentation, climate, everything all at once? Um, you know, we're, we're also seeing, you know, white nose syndrome in bats, which that's thought to be invasive and introduced from Europe. But, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of fungal pathogens kind of coming up together, you know, around the same time um, that, that really is kind of bowling over a lot of species. And so some of them clear these infections and it's, it's nothing, but you know, the ones that succumb, I mean, that, that fox snake, I, I, I was baffled that it recovered from that. And, um, but that required intervention for it to recover. Um, if we're trying to restore habitat and trying to encourage um, reptiles and amphibians, you mentioned one thing you mentioned is big logs, right? Logs. Yeah. Do you have other things to suggest? I mean, I think having, you know, kind of a, a variety of height and structure in the vegetation is good. Um, I mean, if an area is completely burned, you know, green snake's going to stick out like a sore thumb, for example. So they're, on, they're not going to occupy a newly burned area. So having nearby areas with kind of intermediate vegetation height is good. And I would say keeping things on a three year, probably burn rotation, I wouldn't go much longer than three years without burning because then the vegetation structure gets too dense for them. Um, that's really what we're trying to kind of tease out looking at the burn data that we have and where we're finding snakes and when we're seeing them. Um, you know, are they recolonizing sites within the same year that they burned? Um, it's, it's a lot of data to sift through, um, and we need more positive sites with green snakes, um, you know, because you only have a couple of data points where, we, you know, like I said, only 25% of all those grasslands you know, produce them, but we can use other surrogate species like plains garter snakes as an indicator as well. Um, but really, I think just having that, that kind of mosaic of habitat types um, in close proximity is the best way to support their diversity wetland complexes with different hydroperiods, certainly great for having the greatest diversity of amphibians um, and having a high connectivity between those wetland and upland complexes, really important. Mm -hmm. um, what's the, in terms of uh, putting on boards <coughs> and, and rubber mats, mm -hmm. um, can you give us some, like, some definitions or some parameters about what, when, like size-wise, mm -hmm. what when's the best time to yeah. them out? That's time to look for them. So um, the size can vary, and you can, <laughs> you can have um, a very long and intense argument with a variety of herpetologists about the best <laughs> material. I, the last conference I went to, it was it was hours of 
what cover board is best for Kirtland snakes. And yeah. um, <laughs> people are using carpet underlayment and all, it's just all sorts of things. Um, I use two foot by two foot by maybe five sixteenths plywood. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a huge sheet. You can get them under bigger sheets, but I also have to haul the boards out. And so I'm trying to make life easier for myself by doing smaller manageable pieces. Um, and you can find green snakes under those small boards. So um, with rubber mats, we usually get um, scrapped conveyor belt from quarries and cut it. Um, it's very heavy and annoying to carry out. So bring interns <laughs> with you if you're going to do that. And um, uh, I also try to scrap any mud flaps that I find on the side of the road. They, they'll use those mud flaps, although some of them are kind of off gas, so I don't use like the really stinky ones. But um, some that, that are thicker mm -hmm. are a little bit better at retaining heat. And so those are good at the tail ends of the season. Um, so you'll you'll have more captures under them in April and May, and then in September and October, but the middle of the season, it's gonna be slow. Mm -hmm. So having a variety of cover is good. Okay. So they'll warm up quickly, and I also get more juveniles mm -hmm. under the rubber mats. Um, Rich King at NIU and I did uh, a kind of back of the envelope analysis of our capture data using different cover materials and um, when we adjusted for catch per unit effort, we were getting about twice the number of snake captures, regardless of species, under rubber than wood. Hmm. Other so people you, have you put them out, and then you you don't leave them out. I do. You do. Okay. I do. Um, so I usually try to put them out. Like if I'm starting in a new site, I would probably put them out in April or in late April um, because they'll start using them in May. And colonization, if the snakes are right there, will be quick. There, we had a site in McHenry County where you know, we put them out and later that week I had piles of red belly snakes under them. Mm -hmm. So they were there, they just needed the cover. Um, but there are other sites where you know, the vegetation might need to season a bit. So if it hasn't been burned in a while and you have a, kind of a thick duff layer and then you're putting the board under there, it's gonna take a while for the vegetation to dry out and for snakes to really start using it. But if you have a site that's been, a patch that's been burned, I try to do a transect through that going into an unburned habitat. So kind of across mm -hmm. that boundary. Um, so where they're, they probably went to and where they might go back to once it greens up a bit. So you get that kind of gradient. Um, and I usually do um, like a linear transect and I'll space the boards 10 to 20 meters depending on the size of the, the uh, habitat. So okay. and we did some sampling out at Goose Lake Prairie and I think we, we spaced them 20 meters apart and once the vegetation got tall, it became really difficult to find them. <laughs> so, um, you know, having, having them 15, 10, 15 um, meters apart is easier to, to kind of keep track of them. Um, and then I don't check them consecutive days. The more you disturb them, the less likely things are to use them. So maybe twice a week mm -hmm. for a given yeah. site. I, I misunderstood something. Mm -hmm. I thought it was they were coming on top to get warm. They're going, going under, under them. And why, under. why are they going under? It, it actually retains heat and moisture, and then it attracts insects. Okay. So it's, and it's a nice sheltered place to, to warm up. They, they're using kind of the, the um, radiation and the radiant heat from the object to warm up while they're still staying sheltered and too cold to evade predators. So then once they're warm enough, then they go out from the board. So the mornings are good, afternoons are good. Um, I mean, I, f I tend to find captures probably between like, I don't know, 7.30 and 10.30, 11 in the morning, and then there's usually a gap, and then I find it picks up around 2, 2.30 for their siesta. Some people don't check boards until after 4. Mm -hmm.